You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com. It is currently the 30th of March, 2015, here in Japan. And today we're talking on the line to J. Michael Springman, who I hope that long-term listeners of The Corbett Report will remember, if for nothing else than for a previous conversation we had back in 2010. Five years ago now, we talked to uh, J. Michael Springman about his remarkable story at the uh, Jetta Consular Office uh, back in the 1980s. A very interesting story, issuing visas. Uh, for various applicants who are looking to come to the United States. Before we get into all of that, though, we should let people know that he has a new book out about his experience, a must-read called Visas for Al-Qaeda, CIA Handouts That Rocked the World. You can find more information about the book and about J. Michael Springman generally at michaelspringman.com, Springman with two N's. And of course, that will be linked up in the show notes for today's episode at corbettreport.com. Michael Springman, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us again. Well, I'm honored and pleased and and most grateful that you take the time to interview me for your report. Well, I do so because your story is not only, I think, extremely important for a lot of different events that have played out in the past 15 years specifically when it comes to this war on terror, but also because it is uh, certainly one of the less studied aspects of an event like 9-11, where, of course, a lot of the pyrotechnic effects tend to get a lot of the attention. But I think the real story is to be told in some of these consular moves and visas and things of this nature that, uh, that make these events something quite different than what we're presented with. But before we get into all of that, why don't we set the table for people who haven't caught our previous conversation and are not familiar with your story? You were a career uh, uh, state-slash-commerce department officer. You uh, were someone who, from an early age, was uh, interested in the Foreign Service. Why don't you tell us about the story of your career and how you came to be in the the consular office in Jeddah in the 1980s? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, and for the folks who don't know the backstory on this, I had always wanted to join the Foreign Service. In high school, I read a book uh, by uh, William Letterer and Eugene Burdick called The Ugly American. And it basically told a rather sordid tale of corruption, incompetence, stupidity, and so forth uh, in the American Foreign Service. And I said, gee, this looks interesting. It looks like a, something I could do. Uh, I'm interested in foreign affairs. Uh, Let me go forward with this. So I went to Georgetown's Foreign Service School and found that uh, I would have God's own time upon graduation getting into the Foreign Service. Uh, I took the the oral exam, which kind of gets the candidates down to a manageable number, and went into the oral exam where I was grilled by three Foreign Service officers, one of whom was Ellsworth Bunker, who, as it turned out, was a... uh, Vietnam War hawk. And whatever I said, once I had made a comment about American foreign policy problems being Vietnam, um, was wrong. If I, I think if I said my own name, they would have challenged it. Uh, so didn't get anywhere and got a job at the Commerce Department's International Trade Administration and would periodically retake the Foreign Service exam and get as far as the oral and fail that. Well, after being abroad for a couple of years in the State Commerce Exchange Program, where uh, the State Department made positions available for commerce officers uh, to work as real commercial officers abroad, uh, in return for commerce giving them Washington assignments for State Department uh, officers who needed uh, a place in Washington but didn't have a, an assignment at Maine State. So I was in Germany for a couple of years in Stuttgart, and uh, came back to D.C. and retook the Foreign Service exam, and I passed. And uh, it was a different sort of exam, was supposedly based on a real day at the office um, with a negotiating exercise and an inbox exercise and so forth. Well, got in, and then they said, well, you have lousy feet. We're not going to take you. So I sued them, saying this is a, a violation of... Uh, the federal equivalent of the American with, Americans with Disabilities Act. You know, I could walk around, I could uh, write reports, I could go to cocktail parties and do the essential functions of a foreign service officer. So after two years of lawsuits, uh, they said, would you like to be a political officer, an economic officer, a consular officer, or a um, uh, administrative officer? Well, when I went to A100, the basic training course for foreign service officers 
uh, they said, well, you know, when you come into the Foreign Service, they have this big sign in front of the embassy door, and it says, um, political officers and economic officers consort with presidents and kings. Um, commercial officers uh, are no longer a function of the State Department. Um, consular officers are poor people who deal with um, um, social work, essentially, uh, lost American citizens abroad. And administrative officers fix broken toilets. So I decided that since I had a, a minor in economics and had worked at the Commerce Department, I would be an economic officer. So they sent me off as a reward for my uh, diligence to Saudi Arabia, a country I'd never picked uh, on my list of assignments. Uh, I looked for things in Africa and South Asia, where I'd been in India with the Foreign Commercial Service. And uh, I had been told, in fact, by my career development officer, who was going to help me uh, make my uh, bones in the State Department, that, oh, well, you know, the European Bureau wants you for the embassy in East Berlin. Don't sell your house, but it's pretty much of a lock, because what the European Bureau wants, the European Bureau gets. So I get the hand of the, the green flag of Saudi Arabia, and I what is this? And I asked around, I asked John Tasek, who had uh, run the orientation program about this, and he said, well, I thought you would want it to go because you were so happy. Then I asked one of our lecturers, whose name I don't know, and I've forgotten, and I should know it. Uh, he said, well, you know, JET is a commercial post, a center of uh, mercantile activity, and you work for the Commerce Department. We think you'd be a natural for the place. It sounded great for about 15 minutes. And then not long afterwards... Uh, while I was in language training and area studies, uh, I had a call from one of the desk officers at uh, on the Saudi Arabian desk. And these are the people who essentially follow what goes on in the country in political and economic social affairs. And he said, well, the American ambassador, Walter Cutler, is in town. And would you like to meet with him? And I said, sure. And I figured it's a hello and goodbye session, maybe five minutes worth. Hi, I'm happy to be a member of your official family and so on. Well, he kept me for about 45 minutes telling me all the problems my predecessor, Greta Holtz, had created for them and how she was denying visas to servants of rich Saudi women who couldn't travel to the United States without their uh, seamstresses and hairdressers and so on and their other factotums. And I said, well, he's telling me something, but he, I don't know what he's telling me. And I thought, well, Greta Holtz is going to make my career if she's such a horrible person and so incompetent. So afterwards, I asked the desk officer, what was that all about? And he said, well, I don't know. Walter Cutler was just a queer duck. So after trying to get these questions resolved, asking around the State Department about this, I got no answers other than to hear from people saying, well, yeah, we know there's a problem with visas in Jeddah, but we don't know anything more than that. Well, I got there and was welcomed with open arms. Jay Frares, the consul general, said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Greta Holtz was so terrible. She was just a big troublemaker. Got the same thing from Henry Encher, the supposed political officer. And then after a bit, I started uh, getting referrals from these people. You know, well, you know, you have the final say in this. You're at the head of the consular's uh, section's visa program. But uh, we really would like a visa for this guy because he's one of our good contacts. Well, they didn't say any more than that. And after a bit, when, you know, these contacts got sleazier and sleazier, guys that had no ties to either Saudi Arabia or their own country, and in general had no real good reason for wanting to go to the United States, uh, I began refusing their applications. And then the, uh, the requests became demands and they became threats. And, you know, these were guys that, uh, like two Pakistanis who were going to go to a trade show uh, on a Commerce Department sponsored trade mission, but couldn't name the trade show and couldn't name the city in which it was going to be held. And Paul Tveit, T-V-E-I-T, who was a, uh, according to um, um, namebase.org, was a uh, uh, CIA case officer assigned to the commercial section, he called up and demanded I give him a visa. And I refused, and he argued with me. And then he hung up and called the chief of the section, Justice Given Name Stevens, and uh, got the visa. You know, this went on and it went on. At one point, there was a Sudani guy who was a, a refugee from his own country and unemployed in Saudi Arabia. 
and Karen Sasahara, whom uh, Margie Burns, the journalist, linked to the CIA. Uh, she said, we need him. And I said, well, why? Well, we want him. Well, who is we and what? why do we want him? And I kept refusing him. And then she went to Justice Stevens again and got the visa. And one day I stopped Justice in the hallway and said, Justice, why did you give this guy a visa? And he said, national security. And wouldn't say any more. And national security has no legal definition in, in American law as far as I know. So this went on, and I complained to Justice Stevens, who said, you know, do what Frayers wants, uh, ignore this. Uh, I argued with Frayers and got nowhere. Uh, I complained to Stephanie Smith, who was the uh, counselor for consular affairs at the embassy in Riyadh, and she, who big namebase.org, also said uh, was an agency um, uh, official, said, well, you know, this is really very bad. Uh, I'm going to try and step in and see what we can do about this. And... Um, Nothing ever came of it, and in fact, uh, there was. I was being told at this point by um, Nestor Martin, who had good ties to the CIA officials at the consulate, and he was a businessman. And he said, "You know, if you complain to the inspection team, which is coming to Jeddah to see how well they follow regulations and the law, you're going to get fired." And I said, "Nestor, what are you talking about? How do you know this?" Well, I can't tell you. Well, this guy James. Um, McNeil shows up and comes in and says, uh, we understand there are some problems with visas and uh, liquor sales and things like this at the consulate. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't really want to talk about that. And he pushes me and pushes me. And I told him essentially that Nest Martin told me if I said one word about this, I'm going to be unemployed eventually. I said, oh, no, 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 this is totally confidential. Uh, this is important to the State Department. This goes to the very heart of uh, the Inspector General's office. So after about an hour of him pushing me, I told him essentially what I've just told you. And I said, I found this all very peculiar. And he said, well, you know, that's fine. In fact, he told me some things I didn't know. And after that, after he made his report, Frere's rounds on me with a vicious efficiency report, almost guaranteed to get me out of state. And I've since found out that McNeil, um, he had a very checkered career pattern and had gotten the position as deputy ambassador in the Sudan uh, when the Sheikh Omar Abdelrahman, the blind sheikh tied to the 1993 World Trade Center bombings, got his visa. And according to what I saw on Georgetown University's diplomatic studies uh, website, um, McNeil had gotten his job through the Wisner family, which is a well-connected CIA family. And in the uh, interview that he'd given, he had said, well, besides uh, Omar Abdul Rahman getting his visa, there was another agency asset who also got a visa, but nobody's been talking about. And I was just absolutely amazed at this. Uh, it came out in research in my, when I was doing it for the book. So as, as uh, I mentioned in my, our previous conversation some years back, once I got back to Washington and was out of the Foreign Service, I was calling around trying to research an article um, for the Association of National Security Alumni magazine on Classified and ran into the journalist Joe Trento, who said, well, it's obvious what they were doing was they were sending patsies to Jeddah, and if they did what they were told and gave visas to these weirdos, they keep their jobs. If they question things like you did, you're going to be out of a job. And he told me what they were doing was recruiting for the Mujahideen to fight in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. And it was absolutely amazing. And as I did a little bit more research on the book, I found out that there were 52 recruiting officers for the Mujahideen in the United States. And so far, I've not been able to track down other than that they had them in Washington, D.C., and in New York, and in Arizona, and I think Washington State. So we'll see what happens if I can get some information out with my book. Um, but as time went by, I still kept trying to figure out what the big problem was, because the CIA base chief, Eric Kalkenbush, who's now retired and living in Ohio, he stopped me on the compound one day and said, Mike... We've got an agent coming in. We want to talk to him in Washington. Make it look good. Wink, wink. Well, the uh, the guy was running a rug shop in Jeddah, one of these oriental rug places. And he comes in with a letter from uh, on letterhead from his company 
uh, saying why he's going to the States, listing potential customers he's going to visit. Uh, he had previous visas in his passport. He answered my questions about his trip to my satisfaction. And I said, well, God, give me more applicants like him because he's clean and he's on the up and up. And yet he was a CIA asset. And I remember Trento telling me, well, you know, Mike, what would happen if you didn't have a dirt ball come in with no ties to anything, but you had somebody with a clean passport and a believable cultural story? And I said, well, I probably would have issued the visa. And in fact, if they told me what they were doing and why they were doing it, at the time, probably I would have been dumb enough to say, yeah, we all work for the same government. I'll help. I'll stamp the visa. But they never did. And I don't know whether it's stupidity, incompetence, or uh, some idea that they thought that Cutler had wised me up to the situation in Washington and I was rebelling. The, I that, that is the thing that is head-scratching about this, because I think you paint the picture quite vividly in your book that not only in Jeddah, the consulate office there, but also uh, in the Foreign Service generally, these places tend to be infested by intelligence operatives. Oh, yeah. So why yeah. wouldn't they have placed one of their operatives in the position you were in so they didn't have to try to strong-arm someone who wasn't involved in the operation? Well, they had one guy there. He was a part-time consular officer, Andy Weber. Uh, like his predecessor, Brad Braford, uh, he was there part-time, but he would turn to me sometimes and say, Mike, let me take this next guy in line. He's one of mine. And Andy is going to become a dip deputy assistant secretary of defense for nuclear, biological, and... Um, um, but why they didn't tell me since I was there full-time, it would have been a lot simpler. But Greta Holtz, the, uh, the bad girl, she's going to become Deputy Assistant Secretary of State and now is American Ambassador to Oman. Very interesting how that works out. And uh, as you note in the book, she has a DIA background that has since been scrubbed from her official biography, interestingly. So, uh, so yes, a lot of intelligence connections going on here. And it's easy to understand why, given these types of operations, obviously very sensitive. The CIA doesn't want to the public to know about it, so that when things go horribly wrong, as presumably the blind shake getting in on, when he was on a U.S. terrorist watch list happens, well, no one can finger the CIA. Um, but but let's so let's let's draw back and paint the picture here. So what you discovered was really a program, visas for terrorists that were being issued in the 1980s to help the uh, our boys in Afghanistan, the the uh, the non uh, Afghani, the Arab Afghans as they were called, uh, in their fight against the Soviets, and they were being trained in centers in the United States and and recruiting operatives in the United States. So. That, of course, people hearing that story for the first time might say, okay, well, that's all well and good. That was the 1980s. That was when, you know, we were obviously involved in Afghanistan and blah, blah, blah. How does that relate to what happened after that point? And I think the point that uh, we have to stress here is that it did not, of course, stop with the Afghan no. uh, uh, operations. I thought it had. had. I had thought I had complained enough. I had complained to the State Department. I had complained to the Inspector General's office. I had complained to the Bureau of Consular Affairs in Washington. I complained to the FBI and the Justice Department, and I complained to the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee. And then I started filing Freedom of Information Act requests, finding out why I was pitched out. And I thought, well, I could find maybe a way to fight my way back in. And that was denied as a threat to national security, and the whole thing was shut down. And I said, this is more peculiar. Why is it a national security issue if I'm trying to find out why I was fired? So some years went by, and I started looking at what was happening in Iraq, and uh, I remembered Yugoslavia, and then um, started seeing Libya and Syria, and I said, well, wait a minute. This looks awfully like what had happened in Afghanistan. You have this, this what was like a cadre of Muslim fanatics, somehow recruited, trained, armed, and funded uh, taking down governments that seemed to be on uh, America's bad side. And then I filed another Freedom of Information Act request, and it resulted in a lawsuit because the state wouldn't give me what I wanted. And about two years ago, it was finally denied uh, and shut down by Judge Reggie B. Walton, who was on the um, U.S. District Court for the District of D.C., and also is on the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court. And I said, wait a minute, because I'd asked for what I should have asked for 20 some years ago. 
the copies of the visa applications that I had refused and that Frere's insisted be issued. And I would always write on the form, reverse pair order of J.P. Frere's Consul General. And I had made copies of some of the really bad ones and kept them in a file in the office and neglected to make a copy or take it with me. And I subsequently found out after I had told this to um, this O'Neill guy um, that the file had been shredded. So I said, wait a minute. If this is, they can't, the State Department couldn't find the records. And I had, when I was in Jeddah, I had cabinets overflowing with really old visa applications. My staff said, Mike, I know, we know we're supposed to shred these things, but we can either do this or we can deal with 100 to 200 applicants a day and all the paperwork they generate. So I said, fine, we're going to do that. So I told this in an affidavit to the court, which was dismissed. And um, I said, you know, let me look at this. Let me talk to people. Let me do some research, see if I can find out if what I think is really true. If they did create a cadre uh, sometime during or after the war in Afghanistan. And let's see if this thing is really working. I started calling around. Uh, I had gotten the phone number for Ali Ahmad Jalali, who had been uh, a colonel in the Afghan army, a planner for the resistance, and a minister of the interior in the Mujahideen government. And he's now teaching at the uh, National Defense University at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C. So I called him on his cell phone. And he said, well, I'm in Afghanistan. I can't talk to you right now, but uh, send me an email with what you want to discuss, and I'd be happy to talk to you. So I did. And wouldn't answer his telephone, wouldn't answer any emails because I had his email address. And wouldn't answer a letter I'd send him at the War College. And I said, uh-oh. So then I started checking other people in D.C., uh, Iraqis that are progressive, that have good ties to um, to foreign affairs, like uh, this Anna Shalal guy who runs Busboys and Poets, a chain of restaurants in the area that caters to people who criticize the government, like um, Code Pink. And uh, uh, they had Sibyl Edmonds talking there one time, things like this. He wouldn't talk to me at all. Uh, neither would his sister, May Heder, who uh, was a, is an attorney and it, at the time had been defending Muslims and Arabs who had been accused of criminal activities by the American government. Dead silence. Um, Howard Assad, who had worked for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, and had been a nurse for the Mujahideen when the, the war was going on. Um, she told me she didn't know anything about this. And I said, my God, what's going on here? So I started researching, pulling things off of the Internet, out of the Washington Post, out of um, um, Professor Michelle Chosodovsky's uh, Canadian website, Global Research, um, off of Wayne Madsen's website, off of a couple of other sites. And I began to see a picture that, yeah, the Saudis and the Qataris and other Gulf states, the repressive ones, um, if they're not all repressive, uh, we're funding these characters. The um, Bank of Commerce and Credit International was involved in money exchanges and doing a lot of this stuff. Uh, the Saudi ambassador, uh, Bandar, um, what do call him? Bandar Bush, because he was so close to the, uh, the Bush family, he was Bandar bin Sultan. Uh, he was helping fund Iran Contra. And I said, my God. And I kept going on and I kept picking things here and picking things there. And I started to try and knit this into some kind of whole cloth. And I said, son of a bitch. My idea was right. Uh, one, because people who know won't talk to me, including Mel Goodman, who is a CIA official who's retired, who had worked in the Soviet division as its chief and knew obviously what was going on and used a lot of what he knew to get articles published on Counterpunch talking about uh, the people from the Mujahideen are now spreading elsewhere in the world. And, uh, this is a major issue. And I said, it's still going on. And I was told by a good contact in the American government who said, well, I got to tell you in a kind of a between the lines email that uh, I don't know anything about this really myself, but uh, I think uh, it's still going on. And I think that's why people are not talking to you. And he was right. And Joe Trento told me the same thing in an email when I raised this issue with him. So, after 9-11, when the 19, 
alleged hijackers were identified, and it turned out that many of them had received their visas through JEDA, and specifically there was a Visa Express program through which I believe five of the hijackers received their, uh, their, their, their visas to enter the United States. I assume the alarm bells were ringing in your head at that point. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, at that point when uh, this had happened, I had been talking with Joe Trento, and, and Trento said, well, why don't you call the Justice Department about this and tell them what you know? And I called Maine, uh, the FBI, actually. Uh, I talked to Justice. They said, call the FBI. I called the FBI, and uh, they passed me from office to office, and finally said, you need to call the Washington Field Office. And I called them, and they said, well, someone will get back to me. And that was 20 years ago. Well, maybe 14 years ago, I guess. And then in the course of doing research, I, I find that uh, according to the Los Angeles Times, whose Washington um, correspondent I talked to about all of this, and I gave him names of people involved, and uh, that was the end of it. It went into a black hole. But the paper reported that 15 of the 19 got their visas in Jeddah. And according to Celerino Castillo, who had been a drug enforcement agency officer, told me by telephone years ago, that it was common practice for the CIA to sandwich applications and passports from their assets they were trying to get to the United States for one reason or another, in with a travel agency that's sending a whole flood of, of passports and applications to an American Foreign Service post to get visas. And this is what became the, um, the Visa Express program in Jeddah. Uh, everything is now being handled in Jeddah, and in fact, I think in most Foreign Service posts now, by travel agencies that handle a lot of the paperwork and simply provide proof to the American Foreign Service Post that, yes, they paid and this is their application form and blah, 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 and the guys fill out an elaborate 15-page application online to get a visa. But I found it in my research that the woman who issued these visas was named Shana Steinger, S-T-E-I-N-G-E-R, and she had been hired directly out of Columbia University with a master's degree as an FSO4, which is a really high rank for somebody who's just been hired out of school and has no experience. I was hired at the lower rank of five with a master's degree and a number of years of experience at the Commerce Department, including um, a good three years abroad. And then I learned that she had apparently given some rather peculiar answers to the 9-11 Commission when they were investigating this. And despite her issuing the visas to terrorists and uh, giving strange answers to a government investigation, she still has a job with the State Department and it's apparently moved steadily up the tree. Well, just another one to add to the list, I suppose, of yeah. those curious cases of people who do so poorly and end up doing so well in their yeah. career. Yeah. Um, I mean, I talked to a, um, a former station chief who wouldn't tell me um, uh, who wanted to be anonymous, and also Jay Hawley, a real Foreign Service officer whom I had met in India, and uh, both of them said, well, the average is about one in three uh, of spooks to real Foreign Service officers. And uh, when I was in Jeddah, out of some 20 Americans, there were only three people, including myself, whom I know for certainty to have no ties to any of the intelligence services. And this, um, uh, the website namebase.org quotes a Canadian publication, which I've never seen, which supposedly runs about 12 pages, that uh, had named Tveit and um, um, the former French woman, Stephanie Smith, as CIA case officers. They say that the average is about 60%. Well, uh, whatever the exact percentage is, it is certainly a lot higher than I think the general public would understand, although it's the, kind of an open secret in po uh, political circles that this is what uh, these consular positions are generally uh, peopled by. But let's let's talk about moving this then forward from 9-11. From Obviously, we've seen uh, the action in Libya and Syria in recent years. How does this story relate to those conflicts? Well, I mean, the, you had the guys... Um for example, who were fighting in Yugoslavia in the, I guess, the early to mid-1990s, uh, Osama bin Laden was there. He had thousands of his men from Afghanistan there, um, former NSA analyst, uh, teacher at the Naval War College in Providence, Rhode Island, John Schindler, that's the guy's name, uh, wrote a book called Unholy Terror, and he named people who fought in Afghanistan and in Bosnia 
as being part of the 9-11 conspiracy. And as I did more research, I found out that uh, people who had been uh, in Afghanistan, such as this guy, um, Belhaj, uh, who was a leader of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, the LIFG, he had fought in Afghanistan and had organized al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and brought it back to Libya to fight Gaddafi. Even though Gaddafi had arranged uh, for a better standard of living for uh, uh, the people in Libya than in most of Africa, according to the United Nations figures. So you, you kept seeing these, these connections where the intelligence services of Britain, for example, at one point tried to assassinate Gaddafi. And they had spent thousands of dollars in working with an al-Qaeda cell in, in, in Libya. Uh, and they, they tried to blow up the wrong car. But uh, from what I could see in the research, the, uh, there was suddenly a flood of terrorists, and they all had ties to al-Qaeda. There was a flood of weapons into Libya. And, and where was it coming from? And why was it coming? And I began seeing criticisms by Gaddafi of the American government. Uh, and its support for terrorism. He was capturing these guys that he could get his hands on and send them back to where, where they came from. And he, in fact, told Tom Lantosh, an American congressman, and one of Israel's men in the House of Representatives about this, and, and lectured him when Lantosh came with a congressional delegation to the embassy in, in Libya, saying, you know, you Americans have got to clamp down on these people. And that was then. And then it went on to, to Syria, where uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, for example, is getting money and arms from the United States. The American Senator John McCain goes over and meets with them. And um, they get money from the Saudis. They get training in Jordan um, from um, Americans and unnamed other agencies and other unnamed countries. And some people think the Israelis are deeply involved in that. And... Uh, uh, the Washington Post at one point had an article that followed up on uh, um, the journalist Barbara Nimri Aziz. One of her comments on her blog with the New York radio station, WBAI, said, in her opinion, it seemed that the Americans wanted to help fight Assad, but not too much, so that neither side would win and they would essentially destroy the country. And uh, the Washington Post had the same idea about a month later. It is interesting that various pieces of this do seem to be coming out in reporting um, in recent in recent years, specifically around Libya and Syria. We've seen some of that reporting talking about, well, yes, well, we kind of need to aid uh, Al Qaeda a little bit. I mean, even a Council on Foreign Relations article on their blog was talking about this. We need to be friends with Al Qaeda. It is a bit puzzling <laughs> that this is coming out now. It's not puzzling that it's happened or is happening, but it's just that the it's getting seems to be getting some more attention. But unfortunately, the uh, the response seems to be a collective shrug of the American population um, and, and the status care. quo. They're, they're badly educated, and uh, I don't think they're intel terribly intelligent. And as long as they get the beer and they can watch their football games and uh, travel a little bit, certainly not to some foreign country where they don't speak English, uh, but if you're living in Idaho and, and move to Montana for a, a couple of weeks to go fly fishing or something, uh, you figure you've, you've done your traveling. So where does this leave us then in terms of this story? I mean, obviously, this what you experienced was a specific program run in a specific time era, but we can, I think, go far out on the speculative limb enough to say that those types of operations undoubtedly still continue under different auspices in different uh, consulate, uh, consulates around the world. What do we do then from this point to attempt to expose this? As you say, you've attempted to blow the whistle on this for years and uh, been stonewalled and ultimately run out of the uh, Foreign Service exactly. for your efforts. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that we can do anything. I was uh, asked that very same question on Wednesday uh, by a Macedonian journalist, and I said, well, frankly, uh, from what I've seen in Ukraine, where the Americans organized a putsch and have been covertly arming uh, these neo-Nazis in the Kiev government, and now the American Congress is calling for overt arming uh, of the uh, these characters, uh, in an, hopefully in an attempt to overthrow the Russian government eventually, uh, I don't think we can do anything because the Americans are deeply involved, not only in the Ukraine, but trying to um, uh, overthrow the government of Venezuela. They're uh, deeply involved now in Yemen, giving uh, 
if not actual outright aid and comfort to the Saudis, but they're giving them intelligence, uh, national security agency satellite observations, NSA intercepts, uh, and doing their very best to help destroy uh, the the rebel government in the in Yemen because they don't like them because they are Shi and the Shi somehow are tied to Iran and nobody likes Iran because they don't have an atomic bomb, but they think they might want one. I mean, it, it's just a, going to continue. I mean, they've got a covert war going in, in Iran with viruses and the computers and mysterious explosions and people getting assassinated. And we've seen what's happened in Tunisia recently with the people being killed there with uh, supposedly elements came from, um, from Libya. And at the end of my book, I mentioned Tunisia and Oman and Algeria as being possible uh, targets for the next round of uh, uproar. Well, then before you go, it, it's uh, would I would be remiss in my duties if I didn't get your take on the latest uh, uh, skirmish between uh, Saudi Arabia and Yemen and the latest developments happening there. What do you think is uh, taking place? Well, I, I think the Saudis, uh, I guess, at the prodding of their American uh, mentors, and I guess with the new king who's appointed a younger crowd of people in, as government officials, they've moved from let's you and him fight uh, to uh, directly being involved in, in bombing. Whether or not they're going to commit ground forces, I don't know. Uh, but apparently uh, them and the other uh, repressive governments like the Egyptian military dictatorship, which is sending warships, uh, you know, they're going to they're continue as long as they can. And I don't know what's going to happen after that. Uh, I mean, Saudi Arabia is not as stable as the American government thinks it is. Uh, I mean, the Saudis are a minority in their own country. And uh, they've imported all these foreign workers to do the job. And you've got a big chunk of Xi uh, in the eastern province where most of the oil is produced. Uh, whether or not uh, they might rebel openly, there's going to be certainly more dissension in the country. There's been some in the past, and it's been hushed up. Um, I heard tell today that uh, uh, Nasrullah from Hezbollah in, in uh, Lebanon uh, is very upset about this and what they can do, uh, biting at one end and the, the Houthis biting at the other and maybe the Shi in the eastern province taking a chunk out. I don't know. But I, I, I think it's not going to stop with, with, with Yemen. And I think that uh, it's going to be the law of unintended consequences. Uh, they're going to get themselves into something they can't get out of. There have been some very interesting moves geopolitically with Saudi Arabia in the past few years, seeming to move out from under the American umbrella. And um, I don't know where that's going, but it will certainly, certainly, I think, play a role in what's going to happen in, uh, in that area generally in the coming years. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, but I do want to direct people once again to your website, michaelspringman.com, where they can find out more about this book. Tell us just briefly about this book, um, why did you actually write this book? Why now? And uh, and how has it been received so far? Well, the trigger was um, Judge Reggie um, Walton uh, coming up with uh, putting the kibosh on my last uh, Freedom of Information Act lawsuit. I said, enough is enough. Uh, I know enough about this, and I've seen enough things that make me want to write about it. And I think I can start with my situation and extend it out from that was then to what is going on now. Um, I think that, uh, I think I made the, the position. I, I, I talked to the editor of the book. I talked to a couple of journalists I shared, uh, the, the draft with, and they said, well, yeah, you do make your point that, uh, what they're doing in Jeddah is now a cadre of people involved in, uh, coups and overthrows of governments, uh, in the Middle East. And I think you've, you've done it. And I, I've, I've gone back in the book also talking about the long history of American involvement in this, uh, overthrowing the first government, uh, overthrowing the government in Guatemala in the 1950s uh, in the first American coup, followed by the second one in 53 in Iran, overthrowing Mossadegh. And um, as far as how it's well been received, I've got steady sales. Uh, it's available on Amazon US, Amazon Europe, and as an ebook. And I've got two really strong... Uh, uh, reviews of the book on Amazon as well. Well, that is a hopeful sign because, again, it, the people perish for lack of knowledge. They have been uh, duped into their stupor of uh, football and cheeseburgers over the years, not realizing the importance of these types of things. So any 
publicity that this book and uh, and works like it can get, I think, is for the better. So, uh, Michael Springman, thank you very much for your time, and thank you for putting this on the record and writing this uh, remarkable story, and um, all the best to you in, in your future endeavors. Thank you. I'm most appreciative of your kind words and the opportunity to tell my story to your listeners. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.